Hey, how we doing out there, guys? So we're gonna talk tonight. Uh, so the other, other day, I put out the video uh, talking about attacks on echelon and echelon stagger attacks, stepped attacks, uh, echelon attacks, however you want to call it. And so then, uh, you know, kind of in keeping what I've been doing, so we're gonna use a, um, a, a an example of a historical battle. So in this case, I'm gonna talk about the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, so obviously during the American Civil War, uh, so Gettysburg fought over three days, July first, second, third, eighteen sixty three. So now, um, it needs to be said, Gettysburg, especially for Americans, is one of the most studied and well-researched and well-known battles as far as historians go. So I'm going to do what I usually do, which is kind of, you know, keep myself a little bit, uh, you know, of a, of a thousand foot view instead of getting real deep there. Because, I mean, this is a battle we know every single individual company of every regiment, of every brigade, of every division, of every corps. Uh, that uh, what they were doing, and I'm not, uh, I don't remember all of those off of the top of my head, so I'm going to speak a little bit more generally, but, um, and so we'll kind of, you know, discuss a, a few things here a little bit, so kind of talking about the the situation that the Confederates were facing, and uh, that the Union uh, Army was facing, Army of Potomac was facing, and kind of uh, what led to uh, what was going on here, so obviously there's, you know, the, the first battle the first day of uh, the Battle of Gettysburg the um, the Union were uh, they were holding positions you know outside of town on some ridges um, you know kind of uh, in this area uh, north of Gettysburg and uh, the Confederates the 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 whole plan of the Confederates was basically that they wanted to attack some sort of you know state capital or, or relatively major city north of Washington D.C to draw the Army of the Potomac away from Washington. Because basically what the Army of the Potomac had been doing was it kind of just been mirroring as sort of a shield Washington, D.C. So the Confederates went north. The, the Army of the Potomac just basically kind of kept themselves between Washington and the Confederates. And so what the Confederates wanted to do was, one, they wanted to get the, the Army of the Potomac out of northern Virginia. So Virginia had been absolutely smashed by, you know, the two years of war thus far. So they wanted to give their, their farms and their, their people a reprieve, a respite. Um, they wanted to, you know, go somewhere else and take their supplies and things like that. And then they wanted to draw the, uh, the Army of the Potomac away from Washington, find a way to get between the Federal Army of the Potomac and Washington so that they would then be compelled, um, you know, basically by Washington getting on their backs and things like that to attack the Confederates. And then the Confederates could basically fight a defensive battle from a from an area of their choosing and uh, and massacre the the Army of the Potomac in the north and then use that as some form of political, uh, you know, kind of uh, hammer to wield. And I mean, not a bad, not a bad plan. You know, and this is, I'm, I'm not going to get too long into, you know, the, the Confederate, like, you know, well, what ifs and woulda, coulda, shoulda, and could they do this or that or whatever. And it's like for, one thing that we have to know is whether you completely agree with the strategy of the Confederates, uh, you know, in the Army of Northern Virginia or not, is that there was no way to m win from a standpoint of material, logistics, and men. Um, and so there had to be some other way. So whether it was the smart decision, whether it wasn't, whether you like him, whether you don't, Robert E. Lee at least had a strategy that conformed with that idea, which is that they cannot win strictly militarily, so they need to use a military um, operation, military victory in order to achieve a political success. So, you know, kind of thinking along those lines, so as the uh, as the Union gets driven off of the hills and through the town of Gettysburg after July 1st and then into July 2nd, they're formed up basically south of Gettysburg in, uh, you know, what's kind of classically called the fish hook as a defensive uh, position. So if we kind of look at uh, where they're at, so basically, um, so there's like uh, so Slocum Creek's over here, and so you have like Culp's Hill, and so the uh, the Union line basically starts over here. This is Cemetery Hill right here. This is Cemetery Ridge that runs down here. Then what you get over to here is basically have the little round top, the big round top. This is the Peach Orchard. You have the wheat field, uh, the Devil's Den's over here. This is Plum Run Creek there. Um, this is the Baltimore Pike back here, and this is the Tannytown Road. Um, right here, and this is the Emmitsburg Road um, that's right here. So I, I took all the labels off of the map just because otherwise there's way too much stuff there. And looking at uh, like a Google Earth view of Gettysburg is really weird because you'll have all these monuments of like, you know, 
you know, 40th New York here, 20th Maine here, and then it'll be like Joe's Pizza Shop, like <laughs> label next to it. It's, it's, I, it always just, I don't, it, I don't know, it, it, it gets to me, but it's kind of funny. But uh, so anyway, so when we get into uh, July the 2nd, so again, so the Union Line is basically starts here, runs to about here, um, and this is Cemetery Ridge again here. And so, and this is where, and again, I'm going to, I'm going to try to keep myself from getting too detailed because if I, if I try to get too detailed, I'm going to talk myself out of what I actually know without having to, without having like cards mailed to read it a little bit. So, so basically, so the union, uh, line comes along here. So you have somebody by the name of Dan Sickles, who is the commander of the third Corps of the union army of the Potomac and his line ran along cemetery Ridge here. And his orders were to anchor his line on the little round top. So the little round top is right here. So those were his orders. So now Sickles had fought at Chancellorsville and uh, the Hazel Grove had been taken over uh, right in front of him by the Confederates and used as an artillery platform and had suffered very he heavy casualties. So Sickles makes what is now a famous, famously bad decision and he moves his entire third corps from this area here up to the Peach Orchard he sees in front of him. So the Peach Orchard is a, it's about a half mile in front of him or so. And um, sits right astride the Evansburg Road. And uh, it's basically an area of like kind of, you know, like slightly higher elevation or similar elevation. And he does not want the Confederates to be able to get to it and use it as an artillery platform and, uh, you know, use it against him. So he moves his entire corps out here. And so they're basically in a salient that's roughly 90 degrees kind of along, you know, the Emmitsburg Road and this smaller road right here, which I think is just called Peach Orchard Road, um, if I remember right. But, um, so that's the decision that Dan Sickles makes. So now, Robert E. Lee did a, uh, a recce, a reconnoiter, the morning of uh, July the 2nd. At that time, the Union line only extended to around this area, not all the way, not even all the way down to the round top. It was just somewhere in the middle of Cemetery Ridge here. So his order was for uh, Longstreet to attack with his corps um, in the south and for A.P. Hill to attack with his corps, basically supporting him, moving from the south to the northeast to roll up the Union line. So again, the, the, the assumed or the known Union line at the time of the reconnoiter was basically ended roughly right about here. And so um, Longstreet's corps, much of it still had to march in place. So uh, so much of the, the corps made 20 plus mile marches during the day. And so what you end up with is obviously things happen, um, you know, between when the reconnoiter uh, was done, when the orders were given, and when the troops were actually in place uh, for this. So um, the, the goal or the idea of Robert E. Lee was an attack on Echelon. Uh, Longstreet's corps would be astride the Emmitsburg Road. So he would have uh, John Bell Hood, basically here on the right, Lafayette McClaws on the left over here. So Hood would anchor his left against the Emmitsburg Road, which would be the right of McClaws. And again, assuming that this was the extent of the Union line, which it was when he did the reconnoiter, they would roll up the line um, and basically be able to defeat the Union Corps in detail as they rolled up the line. And so then as they rolled up, pushing this attack at Echelon, beginning with Hood and then going to McClaws, then it would pick up with Richard H. Anderson of of AP Hill's Corps, um, and then it would, uh, and then it would, it would continue on going in this direction there. And it also needs to be said that Longstreet's Corps had three divisions, but as we know famously, his his, uh, his additional division was uh, that of uh, of George Pickett. And so Pickett uh, was a whole day's march away from the battlefield, and so that's why he obviously did not take part in uh, in the uh, the second day at Gettysburg, and was famously used in the third day at Gettysburg. So, a couple of things are going to happen that uh, that are going to kind of make this go awry. So, as we said, so Sickles is supposed to be occupying positions that run from here and anchor on uh, basically Round Top right here. So he sees the Peach Orchard here and uh, moves his men forward. So one thing that does, and I've talked about this before with salience, is so a salient is obviously a protrusion, which is you know you could obviously think like okay you have AP Hill's core here they could this could be attacked on on two or three sides you know very easily, but what that also does is it means that where you know if we just kind of look at this in linear distance looking at the computer so instead of covering an inch and a half of computer screen distance 
um, here with his uh, with his core, he's now covering more than double that distance because he stretched this out to a salient. So he does not have enough men to successfully defend this salient. George Meade, the commander of the Army of the Potomac, comes over when he's putting it in place, basically reprimands him, you know, tells him, not exactly, but tells him he's a moron. But as the Confederate attack is imminent, he tells him he's not allowed to withdraw. Because basically it's going to take him too long to reposition to... Uh, you know, to uh, limber their artillery, move it back, and all that stuff um, with the with the assault imminent. So he basically tells them, "You will hold here in place." So this is uh, this is going to have interesting effects. So the actual assault. So so Lee doesn't give the orders until um, you know until about you know like the middle of the day for the attack to begin. But Hood and McClaws did not even get in position based on their very long routes of march until like four and five p.m. Uh, you know, kind of respectively for the two of them. So, you know, we're you basically have like an entire day where kind of technically speaking, nothing is really happening offensively for the Confederates. So uh, this is something I also failed to mention in my shorter video talking about the uh, attacks on Echelon, which is that if you if you listen to, uh, you know, kind of the French General Yamini, uh, who's kind of, you know, famously talks a lot about the attacks on Echelon, one thing that he says, and same thing with Henry Halleck, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Secretary of War, during the Civil War, is that you do not, uh, like, attacks on Echelon are only started in the morning. They're never started in the afternoon. And the reason for that is because the progressive nature of it uh, means that it tends to take a longer time. So instead of being, a, you know, a parallel attack would be like, okay, everybody's ready at two, bam, we go. And that's kind of that. Whereas the progressive nature of an attack on Echelon means that everybody is waiting for somebody in front of them to do something, and then they're responding off of that. So if you start too late with that, then you end up where it's darkness and you, you have lack of visibility, lack of communication, things like that. So as, as we said, Hood doesn't really believe, uh, begin his attack until about 4 p.m. But so as we're moving into position here, so as I said, this is the little round top here. This is the big round top down here. So Hood's men, and, or Hood and McClaw, so Longstreet's men basically see like suddenly, like, okay, this third core is in front of us. So this kind of changes the nature. So as I said, the way that their attack was supposed to be formed was uh, this Emmitsburg Road here was supposed to be um, basically the uh, kind of the geographic feature that they were using. So um, so Hood and McClaws were going to be astride the Emmitsburg Road as they moved through here. But now, as this is in their way, they kind of end up veering more to the east. So instead of northeast, they end up veering more to the east, um, just, you know, given the nature of people appearing in front of them. So, uh, so as they begin this attack... They, uh, they, they begin attacking immediately, you know, running into Sickles' men here. Um, and there's also some, some sharpshooters and things on a, you know, over here around the, the little round top in a place called like, like Slider's, uh, like Slider's Farm. And, uh, and so the, the attack kind of begins there and, uh, you know, places that are now famous. So the, the Peach Orchard, the Wheat Field, the Slaughter Pen, Devil's Den, all that stuff. So Devil's Den is down here, but all the, the other ones, you know, kind of appear up here, the Bloody Wheat Field. Um, and all that stuff. And so as Hood's men and McClaw's men are making their way through here, the other thing that the, the Union is doing is so they're basically panicking because they, uh, um, you know, they, they don't have enough men. Their line is extremely exposed and now they're facing very heavy uh, flank pressure. So again, so the Confederates have three corps. So you have Ewell's Corps up here and then you have A.P. Hill's Corps and Longstreet's Corps. So two thirds of their army, as far as you know, their infantry essentially is attacking this uh, this one end of the line here. So uh, so Meade is going to send reinforcements. So Sykes Corps rushing across to here, um, basically to the little round top into this area. I'm um, here along uh, Cemetery, uh, you know, kind of adjoining with Cemetery Ridge there. So as Hood's men are moving through here, so kind of represented so the the blue line was supposed to represent basically where they were supposed to be going oriented along emmitsburg but now they end up partially because of terrain and because of the third core appearing in front of them they end up starting to veer more and more to the east so they're losing some of their momentum and the weight of their flanking attack and now they're running into um you know they're running into more and more of the union line uh, you know in a kind of a parallel manner here so as this, you know, attack is kind of gaining, uh, you know, gaining weight, gaining momentum, uh, the other thing that happens is right at the time when Hood's, um, you know, furthest right, uh, so Evander Law's, uh, so his furthest right brigade 
is moving up Little Round Top, famously Strong Vincent's brigade, uh, basically appears on there. Um, so famously has the twenty four or the twentieth May and the eighty fourth Pennsylvania. Man, I don't remember the the, <laughs> yeah, the regiments up there. I don't want to speak and say it wrong, but. Uh, they basically get into position as the Confederates are coming up the hill. And that's kind of a very famous part of the battle, um, you know, as far as the, the Confederates attacking up and then basically moving further and further to their right flank to flank the, uh, the position. Then the, uh, you know, the 20th Maine refuses the line and eventually, you know, kind of uh, conducts a downhill bayonet attack, um, you know, against the Confederates. So... While they're dealing with this, they're pushing through Devil's Den here. They're dealing with um, they're dealing with a third corps here. So McClaws, his division is now in action here, uh, dealing with Sickles' corps, and then starting to deal with uh, you know additionally with uh, you know Strong Vincent's corps and them coming up here. A.P. Hills, Richard H. Anderson's his division is uh, launching attacks through here. So uh, Sickles' corps, in the course of this, basically gets completely annihilated um, because they're they're completely exposed. But they basically, you know, needed them to be in position, um, you know, to essentially, at this point, to stall the Confederates as much as possible so they could move additional brigades up, like Caldwell's brigades. Uh, you had Hancock defending, uh, his corps defending this area here. And so, uh, so instead of this being a progressive attack, or it did begin as a progressive attack, where it should have been Hood here, and then McClaws here, and then Richard H. Anderson here, it kind of devolves into everyone is sort of meeting the enemy, um, you know, way closer to, you know, a, a parallel attack than to uh, a truly progressive uh, attack on Echelon. But, you know, nevertheless, the Confederates do manage to destroy the uh, Third Corps here, push themselves up to Cemetery Ridge. Um, they're actually able to take parts of Cemetery Ridge and hold that um, for some amount of time. Eventually it's dark and the, uh, the Confederates did not have, you know, very good support on their flanks they eventually um withdraw and uh you know off of there meanwhile while all this is going on you will over here and there's a lot of debate about what was supposed to happen here so again i'm not going to speak to what exactly did or did not happen what what we're told happened or what we're told was supposed to happen that um you was supposed to launch an attack against culp's hill um and the cemetery hill area right right here the idea being that he wanted to pin as many Confederate Union, uh, pardon me, to pin as many Union um, elements here as possible so they could not be sent to the flank here uh, to reinforce uh, where this uh, large attack on Echelon was taking place. Whereas then Ewell basically said, and nobody really knows what's true now, but basically Ewell said he was just supposed to demonstrate and then to turn it into a full-scale attack if an advantageous um, conditions presented themselves, I believe if practicable was uh, some of the words used with that. Uh, but so what you what you were supposed to have was a classic holding attack here, and that's probably something I'll do in another video here, to pin as many elements of the Confederates here and to draw in any reinforcements if possible. You should have had a progressive echelon attack beginning with Hood's men moving up here along the Emmitsburg Road. You should have had McClaw's men moving along here. And then you should have had uh, Richard H. Anderson or A.P. Hill's corps moving along there. So what uh, we'll flash over to kind of uh, what was supposed to have happened here using kind of a more formal map was that um, these attacks were to build here and to start to cave this flank in, which would essentially be strengthened by each additional brigade attacking its way through here. And then Ewell, so with his two divisions, Early and uh, Johnson over here, are supposed to hold in this area there. So now, again, uh, whoops, so, flashback over. Yeah, so as we said here, so what, uh, again, the line was per, uh, presumed to run to here. Sickles is supposed to be occupying this position here. He advances forward to the Peach Orchard. And, uh, and due to uh, very timely reinforcements, and this is something I've, I've, you know, I've kind of made Facebook posts or something about before. So the Confederates marched all day, more than 20 miles. Um, some of them didn't have shoes. Some of them were unable to like find refills for their canteens. There's actually, they actually think one of the reasons why the Confederates did not take Little Round Top before Strong Vincent's Corps got there was as they crested over 
um, and got on top of and crested over the big round top was that many of them stopped to find places to, to fill their canteens and the cricks and things down here, which slowed them up going up there. Now, the, the historian in you is, you know, always says, well, like, you know, you read about this all the time where the troops stopped to loot the baggage train and the, you know, and this happened or that happened. And, and one, I mean, it is a justifiable critique, you know, from a, from a grand sense, but I, I tend to, to take the side of the, uh, of the fighting man most of the time because I've been the fighting man. And anyone who has ever put on full, uh, you know, battle kit, humped 20 miles, and then been expected to immediately go into the attack, and in this case, uphill, um, in the middle of the summer, and it was unseasonably hot in this July in, uh, in Pennsylvania, anybody who's done that knows what a, what a monumental task um, that is. So, I mean, the, the Confederates making that march and that attack were some very hard freaking dudes, you know, and along the same lines, um, you know, the, the core of strong Vincent, who was down in, uh, you know, on the round top and then also partially spread here along, um, you know, kind of through Devil's Den and towards Cemetery Ridge, they were back here on the Baltimore Pike and they basically sprinted this entire distance to get here exactly as the Confederates were coming up the hill. So again, Full battle kit and everything, dead sprint for, you know, well, not dead sprint, but, you know, a sprint for, you know, half a mile or a mile, basically, to get in position, you know, and then immediately go into uh, a defense against a, uh, a very overwhelming enemy at the time. So, you know, give respect where respect is due, uh, you know, to your forebears on that. So... There's, um, so again, this is a, a, another example of, a, of an on echelon attack, but an on echelon, uh, an echelon attack that failed, uh, you know, kind of famously, but um, it did potentially have its, its opportunities to succeed. But, you know, you know, things, uh, things tend to go awry when it comes to uh, battle. But again, I think this one is, uh, this is an interesting kind of echelon attack one because we have so much information about it. We know what time, who did what, what regiment, what company, what everything did what. But it also, in a way, it was an echelon attack that was beginning against an already um, exposed or taken flank. So what I talked about with like you know echelon attacks, a lot of times are are against an established line to be able to uh, like basically crack a line that gives them access to a flank. Where in this particular case, the flank was already uh, was already in the air. Now the flank was supposed to be anchored on Little Round Top. Um, which was supposed to give it, you know, a very good geographical anchor. But technically speaking, there was nothing back here to have prevented the Confederates from going and flanking further and further, aside from the fact that they were extremely stretched out and, uh, and physically exhausted at the time. But it was not anchored against, um, you know, like a river or something that was impassable. So uh, whereas this progressive attack, this echelon attack, was basically beginning on a flank that was supposed to have been exposed here, whereas then the additional echelons, what they would basically do is as the flank was beginning to be attacked and give way, as these additional divisions or the additional brigades of these divisions attacked, they would basically be like giving additional weight to it. So it'd be you know kind of like you imagine uh, like when you're when you're rolling a snowball down a hill. So you're rolling the snowball down a hill, and then every so often like you kind of just you know give it a little push and it gets picked up and now it gets bigger and it gets some momentum and you give it a little bit of a push. So it's still building its own momentum, but occasionally you're just giving this little extra jolt. And that's what these additional or what these brigades and their progressive echelon attack were supposed to be doing. And the idea of rolling up the entire line basically up to here, um, you know, was, uh, was, was the idea. And obviously that did not, uh, that did not work out. So, you know, then the, the end result was that the Confederates um, had very nearly succeeded. And, um, but the, the federal line at the end of the day basically remained in essentially exactly the same position along Cemetery Ridge here, which would set the stage for, uh, you know, Pickett's Charge um, on the next day. But I just, uh, again, I always think that like, Gettysburg is a very good example of, uh, at least in linear, uh, you know, terms, it's a very easy to understand echelon attack or attack in general. But I think it's incredibly interesting because, one, it's American heritage when it comes to that. But because... So many things happened that affected it, and we get to see in much more detail and clarity than is very typically the, 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 the case, the decisions that commanders made, whether good or bad. So we can see that Sickles made a terrible decision, um, so he should have occupied a very strong line 
that anchored here, and then any reinforcements would have bolstered what was already a strong line. But him moving forward now essentially made the line this additional distance. So it split that, you know, it essentially added 50% to the length of the line there. So, um, you know, so what you have is, you know, the Confederates massively out, or sorry, the, uh, the Confederates were massively outnumbered by the Union, but because of some of their poor tactical choices at lower levels, I mean, the core level is not a low level, but uh, so some of their poor tactical decisions and then very, uh, you know, a high level of tactical proficiency as far as um, some individual Confederate commanders made this battle, um, you know, much more of a, uh, of a you know, a, a fight to a draw than it was an overwhelming victory for any, uh, you know, either side. Now, having said that, the fact that the Confederates were drawn into a battle that was not exactly on the terms that they wanted, that they launched an attack with basically the entirety of the force they had available. So, again, we said they did not have uh, George Pickett's division, um, and that they were not able to achieve an overwhelming victory means that they were now put in the position where they either have to have, you know, fought for two days, taken very heavy casualties in a place, and then withdraw, and then, you know, suffered the morale-related, um, you know, hits and prestige-related and all those things, or they have to stay, they have to launch additional attacks the next day, because they are, again, remember, they are um, further north than the Union Army is. So the Union is between, the Union Army of the Potomac is between them and Washington, D.C. So there is no real good reason for the Union to attack them. So if you're the Confederates, you basically have to attack or withdraw. And the fact that they had been, uh, you know, they had been fixed into this location and, and had attacked, put them in a position where Robert E. Lee did not think that they could um, retreat from there without suffering too much, um, you know, of a hit to the morale. And uh, that influenced uh, the decisions that were very fateful for the third day of Gettysburg. But, uh, you know, this is a battle that I suggest that you guys, you know, go check out because it's, again, we have so much information available for this, the, the battlefield maps. You can obviously go and visit this stuff in person. And um, it's very fascinating, you know, especially because like, I think one thing that can be difficult to do when you're a military history nerd is to, uh, you know, is to kind of put yourself in a position of, you know, of some other soldier or maybe even an enemy or, or something like that. Whereas, you know, with battles in the Civil War and, and, you know, to use Gettysburg as an example, I don't think it's difficult because they have the same names <laughs> that we do. You know, I mean, uh, my ancestors, well, half of them were not in the country at the time, but the, the half that were here um, fought primarily for the Union. And then the, uh, so, uh, so obviously the Iowa regiments fought in the, the campaigns out West. Uh, we're not present here. Um, in the, the Eastern theater, but, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to be able to, you know, these are people whose, you know, names, you know, and names that are still around, um, but that are also like, you know, the, the nature of, of warfare at the time where regiments were, were, were based on, you know, geographic locality. So, you know, a regiment, all of the people would come from the same county or depending on how big the area was, the same city or the same couple of towns and things like that. So, uh, again, uh, Battle of Gettysburg, very excellent example of a failed uh, attack on Echelon. Um, if you're looking for another good example of an attack on Echelon, there was also a failed attack on Echelon um, from the Civil War. The Battle of Antietam and the Battle of Sharpsburg from 1862 is another one. And it's interesting, the, the Civil War, it's, you know, kind of probably the last point that I'll make with this is that, um, so obviously the, the, the generals, the commanders of this time, so they would have been in their you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, in the 1860s. So they would have been born right around the time, you know, kind of, uh, you know, of the Napoleonic Wars and stuff like that. And so the the Napoleonic Wars and then, you know, kind of the Mexican-American War and then, uh, you know, I guess kind of immediately before this, you know, the Crimean War would have been the, uh, would have been the, the relatively or the very recent events that were studied as far as, um, you know, military tactics and military operations and things like that go. So, you know, you see, very, uh, you know, a very large influence of, of that sort of, you know, of the Napoleonic era and the, uh, the various linear tactics and things like that, um, which is, uh, which is, it makes some of this stuff very easy to study with the Civil War, but it's kind of, it's also one of the things that led into the, the absolutely horrendous casualty rates of the Civil War was that you had, um, you hadn't yet advanced to have 
soldiers who were individually trained enough to operate entirely as skirmishers and riflemen and things like that, but they were much too advanced to be in dense formations and operating like the armies of Napoleon's era, uh, in the area in the era of rifled artillery and uh, canister and double canister and the uh, the mini ball of rifled muskets and all that. Uh, and then eventually, obviously, like repeating firearms and stuff like that. But uh, again, talking attacks on Echelon the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg, so July 2nd, 1863. But that's all I got, guys. So remember, only the hits count, and you can never miss fast enough to catch back up.